Thank you. Thank you for having me. I currently serve as the CEO of Linking the World, and we've provided disaster response, development aid, humanitarian aid, in now 43 countries with experience in the use of emerging technologies. I'm regularly in many of the places that we've discussed today, such as Afghanistan, Somalia, Nigeria. I've just returned from Venezuela, where we work to continue to understand the ever-changing dynamics of these conflicts. Humanitarian intervention is active in disasters and conflicts during uh, reconstruction and stabilization phases, and of course in developing countries and impoverished places of the world. So we've seen quite the spectrum, and it was through our work in many of these desperate places that we began to see the connection between poverty and the spread of violent extremist groups. Now, let me be clear that what I'm not saying is that poverty creates terrorism or that terrorists are poor people. Absolutely not. But casual explanations of terrorism that dismiss correlating elements such as poverty can obscure patterns that shed light on how these groups can grow. And as we know, ideology is not the only driver or enabler of the spread or the growth of violent extremist groups. I'll give you an example. In Iraq recently, we went into a town immediately after it was liberated by ISIS terrorists, and we saw how they were able to infiltrate the city in the first place. We saw boxes of food and aid that had labels on them that read, the ISIS Department for Relief. So when they came in, not only were they offering better governance and services than the states, but they worked to win hearts and minds. For us, as an NGO, we know that we exist, we're present to relieve suffering. But we see the high, the growing number of displaced um, or those living in extreme poverty being targeted, being targeted by these extremist groups to amplify destabilizing messages. And the reality is that it's not going to get any better. One-sixth of the world's population live desperate lives, and many may not have a choice one day to have to look to whomever steps into that vacuum. Ungoverned and fragile places in the Middle East, in Central Asia, and throughout Africa, we know will be exploited by extremist groups, and they can become breeding grounds for terrorism. And with the increasingly interconnected nature of the world, once they grow in strength, extremist groups can more easily spread their ideologies beyond geographical borders, as we've seen in these inspired homegrown terrorists and um, how they set an example for domestic terrorists. So for us, it was clear that what's happening over there affects us here at home. But I remember coming back from places like Iraq, ready to be a voice for that mother or father or child in a refugee camp, knowing what needed to be done to be able to uh, stop that specific cycle of poverty or displacement there, only to hear something I believe all of us here in this room have heard when we talk about our work which is, why should we care? We have enough problems in our own backyard. Not my problem. I remember it being a low point for me to come back to the States to feel the polarization, to uh, recognize the ignorance or the apathy. But as practitioners do, we come back we come back from these places with many lessons learned. But lessons aren't truly learned until they're put into practice, right? So if we can't use our experiences and these insights to create or change meaningful policies or even get people to care, it's easy to wonder what we're working, what are we fighting for? 
I know, I mean, who in here knows a burned out aid worker? <laughs> the antidote is that we can find a way to be proactive to prevent many of these circumstances. Uh, after seeing and recognizing this connection, I began to meet with a different kind of group of researchers and practitioners, those that were outside of the normal humanitarian space. Um, I began to meet with those, like many of you here in this room, that were focused on working to counter violent extremism. As an organization, we began to coordinate coordinate our efforts with our military in these conflict zones. And we engaged in stabilization operations and planning. And that was a major point for us because it was there that we realized that the existence of these data tools, tools being used for contingency planning to anticipate the next potential hotspots, you know, identify the next potential hotspots to pre-position force to help shape policy, and then trigger whether it was military or diplomatic activity. As these places around the world were being identified, I was not shocked, however, to see that many of these places were also the very same places that needed humanitarian aid or development assistance. And when you looked at the circumstances of these areas, we could see that as a humanitarian actor, it would take a fraction of the cost to go in now and be preventative than it would be to respond later after things sometimes literally blew up with military action and then you know, the whole cycle of stabilization, reconstruction, and so on. And yet there was a lack of coordination between the military and the NGO sector. And NGOs uh, were definitely not using these kind of predictive modeling and data analytic tools to identify and choose where they worked or how they shaped their programming. So we as an organization saw that this was an opportunity for us to explore this gap where we can add disruptive value to this fight. But this didn't come without its set of controversy because this meant putting humanitarian aid into the context of global stability and, in our case, national security. But we needed to use data, predictive modeling, for humanitarian assistance because at scale, it's still a humanitarian issue. The innocent, suffering people, they are the biggest victims of violent extremism. So how did we become an organization driven by data? We began to work with data scientists and analysts to create algorithms and a dashboard that used open source data sets, whether quantitative or qualitative. By taking the metadata along with the insights that we would gain from the ground, from the local level, we were able to first identify where these vulnerable communities are. And then, once we identify the communities, we could identify what are the root causes, what are the contributors to instability in this specific area. And this is what led to the creation of our resiliency rating profile. Now, we use resiliency as an indicator for success because stability is a point in time, whereas resiliency is a continuum of strength. The index that we've created monitors social, economic, political, and military indicators, and also encompasses demographic pressures and poverty, human rights, uh, state legitimacy, security, and even climate. These algorithms are built to help agencies identify trends and correlate the data to indications of possible extremist recruitment or exploitation or influence. And through this work, we've been helping lead the advancement of the use of data analytics, along with the Institute of Economics and Peace and the United States Institute of Peace. 
This capability allows us to be proactive and to counter violent extremism, but also counter the issues that, frankly, kept us from being able to do our job. So I want to walk through these four um, issues with you, the four being programs, funding, coordination, and security. So first is programs. These tools actually stop organizations from just showing up in a random place and dropping in their solution in a box. This now allows us to create targeted, locally led, and sustainable programs that address the actual root causes of instability and contributors to instability. This allows, even encourages organizations to coordinate and collaborate with one another, which before would be a kiss goodbye to donors when your measurement of success is mostly output-based. Second, and it leads to funding. Funding has always directed much of the programming in our sector. It's uh, led to many organizations, unfortunately, meeting the needs of donors rather than the needs of the cause or the people that we exist to serve. Much of the current funding is allocated or appropriated to approaches that react, respond, maybe even reform. But as we all know, countering, being reactive is too late. Our goal is to make the use of predictive modeling and data analytics a standard tool in how programs are shaped. We'd also like to see, I mean, th this is great for also m &E because with sustained inputs from organizations on the ground, these indices can help programs iterate in real time. The best part about this tool is that we can now show donors and funding agencies the value in being proactive rather than reactive. The third is our favorite word, coordination. In conflict zones, it's critical to coordinate prevention approaches between defense and diplomacy and development. But these sectors typically operate in silos. The problem historically has been that our objectives and our benchmarks for success are so vastly different. Uh, our timelines for programming is so different from the rotations within the military and uh, so on. But what these data tools can do is interlink the value propositions now of each actor and coordinate efforts. We can all still have our own strategic objectives and timelines, but the data can identify where each sector can contribute in any given situation, and it can also show where they have contributed in any given situation. It also um, helps us bypass the issue of neutrality. Organizations work to preserve the assumed neutrality that we have when we come into um, an area. But when we're working in unstable areas where there are, there's an infiltration of violent extremist groups, in my opinion, I don't believe that neutrality exists. The fourth is, of course, security. Security has been a major factor, and in its extremes, it's meant things like uh, organizations working with security contractors. I've seen that putting locals at risk. Or I've seen organizations not get involved just because of the risk of looking like an arm of the US government. NGOs were working to preserve our assumed neutrality when we're going into these areas. And so security may sometimes keep us from being able to work in these places. But there have been new data tools that have been developed to address just that. So when sites are identified to implement programming, we're quite aware of the additional risks that the community might face. And so for us at our organization, we manage the risks by partnering with a company called Predata. They provide us access to their predictive geopolitical analytics platform. This gives us early warning signals of uh, geopolitical volatility. And they do that by processing open source social and digital activity, and then they work with their own unique indicators. 
So when we hear big data and data, data, data everywhere, uh, we have to remember that the data of last year and the data of today are very different and it's constantly evolving. And they are powerful tools in helping mitigate and prevent the spread of violent extremism. And in the humanitarian sense, it helps us truly help people help themselves. Give them a real hand up. No more handouts. And that's what personally makes me excited about this work because I know I'd like to stop going into the field to meet the kind of children in the situations that they are in now. Uh, there's a, one, a young boy in Iraq who lost his mother and father to terrorists. He was displaced by violence. He's growing up surrounded by violence without agency or identity other than that he's a helpless victim. I wonder what will happen if in the future he's offered a sense of purpose or even a job by an extremist group. We now have the tools to identify where these next situations will be and how we can intervene before it's too late. We simply can't just wait around until the next major attack or influx of refugees um, or the next war only to respond using military intervention alone. So here I'd like to conclude, so we have time for questions and answers, um, by thanking you. Uh, many of you here in this room, most of you, you've seen firsthand the state of the world and you understand our role in it. And in the face of some extreme <laughs> challenges, Great odds, you're not just sitting back and hoping that the problems will go away or that we'll throw policies or maybe sanctions to fix it. You're stepping forward from all specialties because we know that none of us are the one solution. None of us are the silver bullet. We understand that there has to be cross-discipline collaboration between data scientists and humanitarians and experts that understand the social cultural, political, and geographic terrains. So thank you for being here and contributing your expertise and working with us towards our collective goal. Thank you.